Our mission is to tell stories of black and brown people, the real, live, current, personal narrative of people of the African diaspora. Stories not only of our heroism and sheroism and victimization, surely those are important stories to be told, but stories also of the spaces and places lived in between. We tell the arc of lives lived in our skins. We ask if you only know us by our tropes, our folk tales, our courageous and visionary historic leaders, do you really know us at all? Tonight's show is what love is. And as we share these ways of being tonight, I invite you to listen, to challenge yourself, to feel the love that our artists tonight are sharing. My dad and I are sitting at the kitchen table and we're in the middle of what feels like a marathon argument about my love life. My dad keeps repeating to me, Jez, just finish the bachelor's degree. Afterwards, you have all the time in the world to fall in love. I am standing at the, at the circulation desk in the public library in my small Connecticut town. My dad is standing behind me and his strong hands are resting on my shoulders, squeezing just slightly with reassurance. My dad is tall, he is ebony black and handsome. I am pimply and awkward at 14. It's 1985. So it's 1973. I'm 12 years old and I'm about mm, 90 pounds soaking wet. And at this time in my life, I am known as Chucky Grady. And I had a very Michael Jackson-esque afro at the time, which was my claim to fame. It was during that time my father was a public servant in New Haven, serving as a police detective, and he had made enough money to move us out of the housing projects in Brookside in New Haven. And we were able to move into our very own house. It was a beautiful beach day. And the, the magnitude of the accident hit me. And I began to imagine what it was like for her to be droggy, driving, fall asleep, only to be jolted awake by her tire, the front passenger tire hitting the curb, just in time for her to feel and see the car invert and then crash roof first onto the ground. What's in a name? Fame, fortune? an alias, a target, a burden. The free dictionary defines what you are labeled or called is arbitrary compared to your intrinsic qualities. For me, it was simple. I was the kid in school whose last name no one could pronounce, Santistaban. I learned very early on that when the teacher started roll call, and they got to the S's and started going, suh, suh, suh. I'd put my head down, I'd put my arm up and say, here, and hope that would be it. But it never was. So graduation day arrives three years later, and I'm sitting on old campus, and I feel like I'm drowning in this sea of black caps. And I look around in vain for a, a familiar face, but the truth is, I don't really know anyone. But nevertheless, my name is called, and I walk up to the stage, and there is my dean holding my diploma. And he says to me, well, Miss Anton, I must admit, I wasn't sure if I'd ever see you here. And I think, <sighs> he must have said congratulations. He must have said some nice things, which I did not hear. I was so angry. I marched off that stage and down those steps, and I vowed never, ever, ever to set foot on this godforsaken campus again. And eight days later, I was on a plane to France. Now, my move to France was not a whimsical thing. It was a well-thought-out plan. 
You see, I had just spent the better part of eight or nine years feeling less than, feeling like a, a second-class citizen, like I wasn't really good enough to be a real Yale. And I was determined to fix that. Now, how, how was I going to fix that? Well, I was going to become sophisticated. <laughs> now, how do you become sophisticated? Well, everybody knows that in order to be sophisticated, you need to speak French and drink French wines and, and watch French films, n'est-ce pas? <laughs> so, I arrive in Paris, and as I'm getting off that plane, I look back over my shoulder at that unhappy, Yale graduate, still buckled in her seat, and I say goodbye. And I turn around, and I walk ahead, and I proceed to live and work in Europe for the next 25 years. I think it took me a little longer than I imagined to become sophisticated. <laughs> so I came back to America. When it was time for me to come back, I came back to New Haven. I was um, working on a project for Yale. And this filled me with much trepidation. I felt very ambivalent, and coming back into New Haven and stepping onto campus filled me with dread. So I devised this little plan. I said, you know what? I'm going to rent an apartment just off campus, live every day in the archives, which is where I had to be to do my research, and then I'm going to hightail it out to wherever to finish the project. Well, you know what they say about the best laid plan. <laughs> About two or three weeks after I'd arrived, I got this email. It read, if you are the first generation in your family to go to college and or come from a low-income background, please join us for Yale's inaugural first-generation alumni conference. Oh my goodness, how did they find me? How did they know? I couldn't even breathe. I was like, I left that unhappy, that Yaley was still on that plane. And so I delete that email. I am so not going, delete, delete. And then I do. And then I do. I go to that conference and I can't believe my ears. I sit for an entire day listening to story after story of alumni just like me. Stories of alumni who felt alienated, who felt like second-class citizens, who still suffered from imposter syndrome. And I couldn't say a word. I sat all day and didn't open my mouth because I knew that if I did, I was going to cry. And that if I started crying, I was never going to stop. You see, it wasn't until that conference that I understood how deep the wounds really were and how much healing I needed. So it's now been five years, five and a half years, and I'm still in New Haven and still in my apartment off campus. And I now have a relationship with Yale. I have a relationship with New Haven. I've become a storyteller. I mentor first-generation freshmen on campus, and they invite me to have lunch with them in the dining halls. Can you imagine? I can finally eat in the dining halls. <laughs> I have alumni friends, good, close friends, who get me, who really get what it's like to be us. And I even give a financial planning class on campus. You see, what I've learned over these past five years is that every time I share parts of myself that I had abandoned long ago, I get back a little piece of my inner Yaley, and that is making me whole. Thank you. We are part of everything, and everything is a part of us. We are human only through the humanity of others. I am because we are Ubuntu.